Good morning and welcome to all. Welcome to this beautiful building, which is a safe place for each person's search for truth, religion, spirituality, and or faith. This building was built 114 years ago by Unitarians for Unitarians. And we feel very privileged and thankful that we are still meeting here every Sunday. My name is Willem Laman Tripp, and I'm your service leader, leader for today's service. I'm a Unitarian member since the late 90s, it's about 18 years. The first 15 years of those 18 years, services were mainly conducted by our own members of, the congrega of this congregation. This is about every second year we had a visiting minister from the States, periods varying from three to six months. The last three years we are enjoying the luxury of a permanent minister and we are very fortunate to have Clay Nails Nelson now as our present minister. This weekend Clay is in Wellington attending the Sea of Faith conference. I believe he's a keynote speaker there. For those of you who are here for the first time, we particularly welcome you, and we may hope that you find this experience ex uh, enriching. As part of the service, please stay with us for morning tea, so we can know you a bit better and more personally. As I mentioned, we have had many visiting ministers. One of the things the, one of the visiting, visiting ministers did was to read some of a word from each of the scriptures from the different religions. This idea came we used at our summer camps, which was many, held many years ago. And we had like a quiz where we had quotes of these famous uh, philosophers, religion speakers, whatever, and people had to guess what it was. So today, my opening words are quotes from... The, the other thing is that uh, we now also do it on the mountain weekends, so be very careful that you listen, because these could be questions when you come to the mountain weekend, which I'll ask you in September, in October, uh, in August. So this is, a, this is a quote from the Buddha. Believe nothing, no matter where you, are, where you read it, or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. A quote from the Dalai Lama. We can never obtain peace in the outer world until we make peace with ourselves. Martin Luther King. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. And then one from Hugh Jackman. Don't know what he is from. <laughs> if you put Buddha, Jesus Christ, Socrates, Shakespeare, Arjuna, Krishna, at the dinner, day, dinner, dinner table together, I can't see them having an argument. So now we come to the chalice lighting. Maybe you can help me. As surely as we belong to the universe, we belong together. We gather here to move beyond our isolated selves as we connect and reconnect with others.
Our speaker today is Michael, Michael Jones. Michael Jones is a Unitarian member for many years, member of this congregation, and I think he may also be a member of an American association. He lived on a boat for a long time. He sailed the boat, I understand, from America to New Zealand. He, lives, he, he says he comes from Kansas, and I, I looked it up in the map, it's right in the middle, so I don't know how you sail from the middle of America <laughs> to New Zealand, but anyway, that's what he done. And his latest achievements are as a skier and an artist on our mountain weekend last month. So, Michael, please, where are you? Oh, you're there. Kansas to New Zealand. This is a nice touch. I want to thank Sharon for that. That was uh, very cool to bring this little sailboat. Um, it's a sloop, by the way. And um, for those of you who don't know that, and God, the flowers are terrific. We tried this earlier to, to see if we can, can make this work. Several weeks ago, when Clay asked me to, uh, to talk about something, he was unclear as to what that might be, and he said to give him a title, and um, I was thinking about being in New Zealand. Uh, if you come from America to New Zealand, those of you who are Americans in the audience know what I'm talking about. This is a, is a really, really special place. And... <clears throat> It was clear in the process that I wanted to talk about <clears throat> how we got here and what it took to get here and a little bit of the story that permitted us to, to do that. And <clears throat> um, our dream <clears throat> really began when we were um, in Kansas City, of course, and my thought was, how did we get on a 36-foot sailboat? How did we find jobs? And how did this all transpire that we could, we could be here? Uh, <clears throat> Roxana, in 1996, had had enough of me chasing my tail, trying to do business in Kansas City. I had a relatively full life and was doing... Uh, doing things that I love to do. She, on the other hand, not so much. She had sold her business and was looking for something to do and decided that, that maybe the Peace Corps for her or us, my choice, could, could be something that we could, <laughs> we, could be, we could do together. Well, that summer I went to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, to what's called the EAA, Experimental Aviation Association, and met a guy from New Zealand. He was a professor in Canterbury, taught business. I have a, a, a degree in business and entrepreneurship and thought, well, hell, I'll, I'll um, talk and I'll find a job in New Zealand and I won't have to go to Russia. And, and so, Anyway, remember back, Dennis Conner had lost the America's Cup 5-0 in California. Americans that loved sailing were embarrassed that they could do that to us and not look back. And so I invited this guy and his family to Kansas City to come see us. He was on sabbatical in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is North <laughs> University of Nebraska there. So... Down he and his family come, talks about this place where he's from. And so he lights me up like a Christmas tree. I'm ready to do something. Russia, uh-uh. It's cold there. Can't speak the language. Get on with your life. And so 
I mentioned this to Roxana after they had left, that perhaps we ought to consider coming to New Zealand. And she said, I'll go to New Zealand, but you have to have a job first. Yeah, well, I thought, okay. The, inter the internet was up for a couple years, and, and people were using it quite a bit, so I got on, I got on it, and away you go. And who did I use? It was, remember those old, old um, search engines? Alt, um, what the hell was it? I can't remember now. I mean, I just use Google. I don't know anybody that doesn't use Google and because it doesn't work as well. But anyway, we found a place, <coughs> sent out my resumes, pretty silent, you know, not much interest in this in me coming to New Zealand and working. And so Roxanna, of course, was crunching away on our Peace Corps applications, and they were going forward, and, and uh, I'll be damned. We, uh, we ended up there. And the fact that I can, can say to you, Dobri Dean, Gadia Toleta, Minya Savut Michael, which means my name is Michael, lets you know that uh, we went to Russia. And, and we had a, uh, an interesting, interesting time there. But she wasn't going unless I had a job, and so we went into the Peace Corps. I want to stop here just for a moment because as I thought about dreams and me being here and not there in, in the U.S., what is your dream? And, and what, uh, what some of you have acted on your dreams and have made them happen. I did some Googling. And one definition of dreams is a series of thoughts or images and sensations occurring in a person's mind during sleep, a coping mechanism. Um, yeah, it's that. Another dream, another, uh, the second definition is a cherished aspiration, ambition, or ideal. And that, that's where I come, I believe. We had our ideals of certainly what we wanted to do. We were frustrated with our lives in Kansas City. Roxanne is certainly more than I. But it's a couple of interesting facts about these dreams before I move on. Though people may never remember their dreaming, it's thought that we dream between six, three to six times per night. Each dream lasts between five and 20 minutes. Mine seem to last longer. Uh, and women dream differently than men, more about children, indoor activities, men more about outside adventures and doing other stuff. But, Let's get on with it here. Out of these dreams come an element of reality, seemingly nothing but producing an experience with lifelike time frames and connections to our darkest fears and fantasies or a way to live your life. So, we've all camped out in our summers, in our yards, in the back or, or in the North 40. My first big idea came when I was 10. I was out looking up, as we do at the Milky Way, and saying, man, I want to go. So my big idea was to send some brain waves to some extraterrestrials that are flying by <laughs> Kansas, Stop and pick me up and I'll go with you. You all, those of you who are got gray in your hair know about the 50s and, and the UFO things that were, I don't know if they were dancing here as much as they were in the U.S., but we had lots of press on UFOs and Area 51 and the conspiracies of the government. We had uh, people that, you know, were saying... By God, I was taken out, you know, I was picked up. And so, anyway, I thought that'd be really cool. 
And uh, needless to say, as far as I know, it never happened. <laughs> but the idea was that to leave and travel in the galaxy really appealed to me. I'm, I love science fiction. I'm a, I'm a Star Trek fan today. And uh, because of that, in some respects, I think uh, I had the opportunity to become a pilot. And that's an interesting story, too. But I take you back to my world geography teacher, Mr. Hughes. He, he looked a little bit like Dave Rohe. I'm so, you know, he's, he's tall, he's, didn't have much hair, deep voice. And, but he had some experiences. And on his wall was this huge world map. You've all seen them. You saw them in elementary school. Huge map. Here's Europe. Here's Canada and Australia. And then, of course, New Zealand is down here. It's an afterthought, you know. I mean, it's, it's nothing. But it was in, I can tell you, it was in September. It was 1958. I was in the ninth grade or fourth form here. And we were in the afternoon class, and we were talking about early seafarers, the Gama, Magellan, Columbus. However, I had to come. He didn't know about Cook and Tasman. I had to come here to learn about those guys and what they did here. But my imagination was set on fire. I was, and some of you know this because you've had those experiences where you can go left and you can go right. Well, I was going, holy moly, I can do this. I can go to Nairobi. I can see Kathmandu, uh, Bombay, Mount Everest, Fairbanks, Alaska. I didn't see the ocean, unlike most of you in this room, until uh, I was 24. And it was the Atlantic, and it was, oh, damn. It was amazing, and, and you all, I don't know, but for a Kansas person, you see the ocean, you go, where in the hell have I been, and why was I born in Kansas? <laughs> you know, I mean, it felt comfortable being in around water for some reason. It's like, it's like mountains, too. You know, it, it's a longing that you're not sure why. It's... It's there, it, it, it permeates, you know, what you do and, and, and some of the things that you do and, and how you do it. But it was interesting to, to note that um, I, was, I was really never the same. There was always something hammering, hammering at me as I worked my way through high school. I, I was in Boy Scouts. And we all do that story, you know, where we camped out every month. Uh, rain or shine didn't make any difference. So I was comfortable in wet snow. It didn't, I didn't care uh, or got, to, got used to ignoring that or preparing for it. And so it felt like, uh, you, you know, New Zealand was a place for me because those skills, you know, came in really, really handy. And after university, um, uh, or excuse me, before I graduated, the summer before I graduated, I'd met a guy on a train, as you do from time to time, and he was a partner in a gold mining opportunity in Fairbanks, Alaska, or north of Fairbanks. And he saw me on this train with my long hair, my backpack, tennis racket, of course, and was curious about what I was doing on this train going to Boston. And I told him that you know, I was taking a trip and going to see my college roommate. And so he got to talk and he said, well, how we need some people to drive a truck from Colorado to Fairbanks, Alaska. Ho. I'd hit the jackpot. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, I immediately connected the dots. I'm in. So I put my resume together, sent it out to this geologist at Colorado State early enough that he hadn't gotten his crew together, 
put me in the mix, said, yes, we'd be glad to have you join us. Be in Fort Collins, you know, on May 20, you know, as soon as you're finished with school, and away you go. So I hitchhiked to Fort Collins, and away I went. But that's a whole different story. But the point I'm trying to make is that that didn't scare me in the least. I mean, Alaska's only 5,000 miles, and you're driving a truck, you know, and so, it, I mean, it's further away. I went further away than going to England or, or Europe in a truck. I was driving that way. So when I got back from fighting forest fires and working in a placer gold mine, and I do have this mammoth tusk that I hitchhiked from Fairbanks to Denver with, it's 35,000 years old because I went to the Denver Museum to find out about it. it uh, from the Pleistocene period, and the curator offered me $200. Here, let me have, I'll, I'll buy that for 200 bucks. No way, Jose. So, I've got that. But that was said to tell you this, that my next dream was to circumnavigate the globe. Backpack, tennis racket, chest set, I'm away. So as those stories unfold, one day I'm hitchhiking in the eastern part of the U.S. A guy picks me up and says, where are you going? I said, I'm not really sure. He said, I'm going to Newport, Rhode Island, where the America's Cup is. This is 1970. Why don't you go there? I'm sure you can find a boat. They all need crew after they get ready to leave and you can sail away. Great. <laughs> Why not? You remember when you were younger, like that, when you were able to make those kinds of decisions. Do I go to Newport, Rhode Island, or do I go to Washington, D.C., and you just, hmm, I'm going to go this way. So I went that way. And like he said, I did find a boat to live on and work while I was in Newport and the races were going on. And needless to say, I also found a boat going to St. Thomas in the Caribbean, in the Virgin Islands, and off I went. Well, that connection put me in touch with a fellow who was going to England the following spring across the Atlantic to the Isle of Wight. Guess what? I was on that boat. So I'd made this trip across the Atlantic, and because of Mr. Hughes, I knew where in the hell I was going. <laughs> and I was excited about going there. I didn't have any qualms about being on a boat after it felt so comfortable. I don't know why it was so comfortable. I don't know why I felt so at home on the water and you couldn't see any land. Doesn't make sense to a lot of my friends, but it makes sense here because you guys, it's part of your culture here. People put their jobs on hold and go sailing, come back, their job's waiting for them. It's part of the culture here. I love, I love that. I did that a number of times here to go up to the islands and come back. So, let's get back on task here. I uh, uh, graduated, and then I took off for three years doing, as I just told you what I did, travel around. And when we got back, I resumed a more normal um, business life, started a business to take high school kids and college kids on field trips around America for high school and college credit. I translated my experience on the road, you know, to giving that, sharing that experience with young people who would then camp their way across our national parks. We had a teacher on board with a curriculum and a syllabus, and those kids were loving it. Grand Canyon to the bottom and up, Washington, D.C., if you spoke French, we took you to Quebec. And if you wanted to do some history, we went down to 
through Texas and, and the, you know, the Santa Fe and had a great time doing, doing that. Couldn't make any money. But I did make money on, the, on weekend ski trips to Colorado. Made a hell of a lot of money busloading people overnight to Colorado skiing, come back Sunday night, be in time for school or work Monday morning. It was perfect. I was a really good skier for a Kansan. And I got to do that with Dave and his crew. So, as we moved, moving along, Roxanne and I got here after Russia. And we just happened to hit it right because they needed teachers here for this, you know, this great business of teaching Asian students, many of them graduates from their universities at home, but wanting to improve their English or go to school here to get a Western degree. And so we hit it just right. We came as tourists, became <coughs> residents after a bit, and uh, citizens because Roxana wanted to. I was good enough being a permanent resident. Ah, ah, I want a dual citizenship. So, as we do from time to time, okay, we spent the $1,500 and became dual citizens and have not regretted it in view of the fact of this circus that we are watching going on in America right now. It's bizarre. And sometimes I tell people I'm Canadian, you know? Or, because I can't tell Kiwis that I'm a Kiwi because my accent gives me away. But they don't know from nothing about Canadians. And so I have done that. So we come in and we're both working and we're driving around uh, the Wadamata and we see these little, these little white triangles on the water. We look at each other and say, what the, why aren't, why don't we have one of those? It's a little sloop here, Jonathan. And that weekend, the next day, we were in boat yards looking at boats. We didn't know from nothing about boats. We didn't care. We just started knocking on doors to find out what you have to find out to either buy a boat, sail a boat, or whatever. I had sailed a boat, but only as a crew. And so being a crew, you don't know much. You just do what you're told. But I knew I loved it, and so off we go. So after about six months, we find a boat, 36-foot. It's a coastal boat, they call it. Local New Zealand designer, Dennis Wright. Some of you may know the name. A Lotus 10.6. We park it at Bayswater, and that's where we live. But we don't know how to sail it. We don't know how to drive it. We barely know how to start it. So we took the lessons, as you do. We found, we found the Coast Guard classes, and, and off you go. You know, you do your boat master, and then you do your coastal skipper, and then you do your offshore navigator, and... You do all that stuff, and you build it up, and we found an instructor, took us out, and got it, got it where we needed to, to go with it. Part of this, this, you know, be careful what you wish for, is that you have a hell of a lot of unknowns. Well, my preamble was that I was comfortable dealing with unknowns, and Roxana less so, but... I could make it easier for her by the fact that I knew that we could, could make things work here. You know, and, and so it gives you pause that you think about, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? You know, boat size. What style of boat do you take? How does the insurance work? Navigation. First aid. How do you anchor the dam? And it's not the anchor that, you don't know this, but it's not the anchor that keeps the boat where, it's, where it is. It's 
the, the amount of chain you let lay on the floor of the ocean. And that absorbs the rising and falling of your boat. So the anchor is never stressed very much, ever, unless, there, unless you're in a huge storm. It's just the weight of that chain that you know, springs up and springs down. So, <clears throat> compatibility. You know, Roxanne and I were living in a space from like over there to over here, and we can get pretty testy sometimes. We're both co-captains. Co-captains hardly ever work in any situation. I wasn't willing to let her drive the boat. She wasn't willing to let me drive the boat totally all together. So we work that out as you do, but I keep thinking, you know, the technical skills. Weather, meteorology, maintenance, money and lack of money, relentless unknowns, and new friends here and other places. It's, uh, it was scary not being scared. I had had dreams of sailing and being uh, around you know, from Mr. Hughes's class, learning about trade routes and horse latitudes, and magnetic variation. Our life has been an adventure. And we made the decision to make memories and not money. And, and we're still working on that. We're completing our third application to the U.S. Peace Corps. We have been accepted to serve in Ukraine starting next year in March. Uh, we'll back to Kansas City. Um, we're going to then leave and go to Kiev. And we love the sound of that. And, and, the, adventure, and the adventure continues. And, and our knees still work. <laughs> and, we, and we still love what we're doing. And I got asked a question earlier, has New Zealand changed much from, from when we were here before? We left in 2010, and Willem's given me the Hawkeye, but I'm going to answer this question anyway. Yeah, it has changed. He, uh, New Zealand seems to be moving a lot faster than it used to. A lot more traffic, a lot more dependence, it seems to me, on, on the social programs. Uh, there's a lot of good things happening here. Uh, I'd rather be here than not. But, uh, yeah, New, New Zealand is, is joining that, kind, kind of that rat race, you know, of being, of being busy and hurried. And so it, it's I think catching up or caught up. I don't know what the word is, but uh, in Auckland, at least, it's, it is different. So thank you. We'll do a very shortened meditation. Um, so just, uh, just come to stillness. Just rest. Beware of where you are now. Feel the weight of the body on the chair. Let sounds be received without comment, naming, or judgment of any kind. Let the hearing run right out to the furthest and gentlest sounds embracing all. Simply rest in this great awareness for a few moments.
Closing words. Again a quote. Closing words from a temporary famous philosopher. Winnie the Pooh. Rivers know this. There is no hurry. We shall get there someday. <laughs>